Good morning, everybody. Um, so the topic of the last lecture, the topic of the last lecture was the propagation of electromagnetic waves in vacuum, which was the preliminary for what we want to talk about today and what we're really interested in, which is uh, how do electromagnetic waves propagate in uh, materials. And therefore, we will talk about uh, continuous media. We will talk about uh, the dielectric displacement and the polarization vector. And we will look at Maxwell's equations for continuous media. And um, I will develop the wave equation not only for the isotropic case, but also for some anisotropic materials. And the reason I want to do this is because a lot of people here uh, work with distorted perovskites. And if all we know is silicon and gallium arsenide, uh, which is how I grew up in my PhD thesis, then we don't need to worry about any anisotropies. But with the materials that are more of interest today, uh, and isotropy is important. There are two very uh, simple uh, classical uh, models, the Lorentz model and the Drude model. And conceptually, these models can explain a lot of the effects that we observe in materials, especially in the infrared spectral region. And then um, <coughs> I don't know exactly if I will go all the slides in this set because the next lecture in three weeks, lecture five, is a continuation of what we do today and will be an application of the, uh, so the next lecture will be about applications of the Lorentz and Drude model. So if I cannot finish this today, then um, I will continue with the next lecture five. Um, the, uh, uh, here, as, as I always do, uh, here are some references in case you want to do some reading. Uh, the volume eight of Landa Lifshitz on continuous media is very, very good. And um, there is also a book by Agronovich and Ginsberg, which I did not know about until I prepared for today's lecture. And that deals with some very complicated things that you would never normally think of. Uh, such as spatial dispersion and uh, crystal optics in highly anisotropic materials. Um, the book on uh, the Handbook of Ellipsometry also includes uh, uh, chapters by Josef Humlicek and Rob Collins, which deal with the propagation of electromagnetic waves in continuous media. And a very simple introduction is given by Mark Fox on uh, optical properties of solids. So these are the references that I would <coughs> recommend. This slide summarizes what we talked about in the last lecture. And on top, I'm giving you the differential forms of Maxwell's equations in vacuum, where the current and the charge density have been set to zero because there are no such things in vacuum. And then we find plane wave solutions. We Fourier transform these Maxwell's equations. And then instead of having differential equations, we have simple uh, vector equations. And we learn that uh, electromagnetic waves are transverse. So in vacuum, in vacuum, the electromagnetic field and enters both in Gauss's law for the Coulomb force and also in Faraday's law. Uh, and therefore, uh, the electromagnetic wave is truly uh, transverse. There are no complications to this transverse condition from the anisotropy of materials that we will encounter later when we have to introduce the dielectric and magnetic uh, tensors. So the... Um, the wave vector is proportion the wave vector is perpendicular to the electric and magnetic fields and they are perpendicular to each other uh, 
This is the dispersion relation, which gives us the wave vector as a function of frequency. And there is also a relationship for the magnitude of the, electromagnetic, of the electric field to the magnetic field strength. And this constant here is the impedance of vacuum. So that's what we talked about uh, last time, Maxwell's equations in vacuum. Now imagine that uh, we have a dielectric and materials consist of uh, positive and negative charges. Uh, materials have um, nuclei which are positively charged or atomic cores which are positively charged and electrons that are negatively charged. So in a material we have a certain density of positive and negative charges. And now we take this material and we put it into an external electric field and what will happen is that the positive charges will move to the left, they follow the field, and the negative charges move to the right, so they go uh, against the direction of the electric field. So now, in addition to this externally applied field, there will be an induced field uh, inside the material which opposes the external field. So the total field, the total electric field, sometimes called the local field, is the sum of the external field and this uh, induced or depolarizing electric field. In a metal, the total field is zero, at least in the DC case, because in a metal no uh, electric fields can survive. The charges just move around until uh, all the fields have gone to zero. So in a metal, the external field and the induced field are exactly equal to each other, but they have the opposite sign. In a dielectric or in an oxide, in an insulator, uh, the uh, induced field will typically be smaller than the electric field, so the local field is smaller than the applied field, and this phenomenon is called screening. Uh, we make certain assumptions here, like the uh, dielectric is uh, infinite. Uh, that avoids certain problems that the local field depends on the crystal shape, and uh, we don't worry about boundary conditions. So now, since the charges move inside the material, there will be a dipole moment. So the dipole moment is defined as the product of the charge and the distance between the two charges. So if I have a negative charge minus Q and a positive charge plus Q, and they are separated by this distance D, then the dipole moment is equal to QD. The dielectric polarization is defined as the dipole moment per unit volume. So if I know by how much the charges can move, then I can uh, calculate the dielectric polarization. And the dielectric displacement is defined as the sum of the field, the electric field, times epsilon zero plus this dielectric polarization, which comes from the uh, motion of the charges in response to the applied field. Um, for sufficiently small electric fields, the polarization will be proportional to the uh, ex electric field. So we can also say that we can expand the polarization in a uh, Taylor series and we only keep the lowest term. And this proportionality constant, that is called the dielectric susceptibility. And then um, the, dial, uh, the dielectric displacement similarly is proportional to the uh, electric field. And now here, for in, when we calculate the dielectric uh, displacement, then we have to take into account not only the contribution of the material, but also the contribution of the vacuum so the one, the one that is the susceptibility of the vacuum, uh, 
and which gets added to the susceptibility of the material. So the dielectric constant is one plus this electric susceptibility. So um, here are some complications uh, that we can encounter in actual materials. So the first uh, complication is that the charges that move in response to the field may not necessarily move parallel to the applied field or anti-parallel to the applied field, but the depolarizing field can be in a different direction and therefore uh, the local field which is the sum of the applied field and the depolarizing field this needs to be treated as a vector equation so this is the applied field this is the depolarizing field and um, the sum of these two that is the uh, total field so why would that happen uh, if you have a metallic bonding or ionic bonding then in such materials the electrons can move in any direction they want but if you have uh, partially covalent bonding then the electrons will only move, want to move in certain directions so the uh, electrons can move more easily in one direction than in the other direction and therefore a field applied to the right will actually give us a depolarizing field in a different direction. Uh, so that's one complication. Another complication is that we may have a non-zero polarization even for a zero applied electric field and uh, that is called uh, ferroelectricity. So a ferromagnet is a material where you have a non-zero magnetization in the absence of an applied magnetic field. So the same effect can happen in a, uh, in a dielectric that you have a dielectric polarization in the absence of, a, of an applied electric field so this is the remnant polarization in this uh, ferroelectric. A pyroelectric is a material where you get a uh, remnant polarization uh, as you change the temperature of the material. And these pyroelectrics have been known for a very long time and until a few days ago I knew what uh, the example of a material but this has been known since ancient times. In, in the ancient Greeks uh, knew about pyroelectricity. And the uh, third uh, reason why you can have a, uh, st a static polarization in the absence of an electric field is piezoelectricity, that if you take a material and you apply a strain or a stress, then you can also get a polarization even for a zero applied field. Uh, these things are rather slow, so we have to worry about them mostly in the static case. Uh, so with, if we deal with optical frequencies, then we can typically ignore this uh, and we don't have to worry about these complications. Something else that can happen is that we can, instead of cutting the Taylor series where we expand the polarization as a function of the magnetic field, um, instead of cutting this with a linear term we can go to higher terms and uh, there is this so in this case the chi would be the linear chi the, the chi 1 that's the linear susceptibility but there can also be a chi 2 and a chi 3 which are the second and uh, third order uh, susceptibilities um, many of you will have heard about frequency doubling so that if you have a laser with a red wavelength, let's say 800 nanometers, then in a nonlinear crystal you can double that laser frequency and you can get 400 nanometers. And that it would be done by this uh, uh, chi-2. The chi-2 would be responsible for this and that only happens with very high electric fields, so that's why you need a laser for that.
the chi 2 is 0 in materials that have inversion symmetry. And therefore, we consider this chi 3 in materials that uh, show inversion symmetry. Of course, we can always break the inversion symmetry by studying what happens at surfaces. So at surfaces, even silicon, even silicon surfaces will show uh, frequency doubling because of this um, chi 2 effect, uh, because of the surface where you break the inversion symmetry. Um, you might ask, can we, can we get a polarization by applying a magnetic field? And if you look in books, then uh, you will always see this type of an equation that couples the electric and magnetic fields. Uh, for a while, for about three years, I thought I had found an example for this in nickel. Uh, unfortunately, what we had seen was just a dirty surface. And um, so in, there was not actually an influence from the magnetization or from the magnetic field on the uh, polarization. So in the more general case, we will write the dielectric displacement as this uh, remnant polarization plus something that, has, that comes from the uh, dielectric constant and the electric field and a similar term where a magnetic field gives us a contribution to the dielectric displacement. <laughs> now, um, what we've done for uh, electrostatics, we also have to do for uh, magnetostatics. And um, my notation here, the, the notation that I'm choosing here is symmetric, which means that I'm using the same notation for electric fields that I use for magnetic fields. And therefore, all the equations for the electric stuff will look exactly like the equations for the magnetic stuff. Of course, that is convention. And the people that practice with uh, magnetism will be used to somewhat different equations. Uh, so uh, don't take this. Uh, don't be surprised if you will find different notations. So the electric field strength, the depolarization, and the dielectric displacement, in magnetism, the, the uh, related quantities are the magnetic field strength H and the magnetic flux density B and the, magnetic and the magnetization M, which is the magnetic dipole moment per unit volume. And just like we write the dielectric displacement as a sum of the various contributions, we do the same for the magnetization, that the magnetization, there is this remnant magnetization, which we find in ferromagnets. And then there is a linear magnetic susceptibility, which is proportional to the magnetic field strength. And then perhaps there's a contribution from the electric field to the magnetization, but I cannot give you an example. That's just a theoretical term that we throw into the equation. And I should say that the, the way where the notations differ is whether that M0 is a, that the, the um, permeability of the vacuum, mu0, whether that is or is not included in the magnetic susceptibility. That's where the notations differ. But I prefer to write it this way because now this equation looks exactly like the equation that we have for the dielectric displacement. So just like we have introduced uh, the dielectric constant epsilon as 1 plus the dielectric susceptibility, we, defer, we define the magnetic permeability as 1 plus the magnetic suscept susceptibility. Um, this is a mistake. This should say mu is equal to 1. So. Ferromagnetic effects are very slow. And by slow, if you, if, you plot the, uh, if you plot the mu for a ferromagnet as a function of frequency, how fast can you switch? 
then people typically plot such curves in the kilohertz to gigahertz regime. And for those of us that do optics, this is all of zero frequency. For us, frequency doesn't start until you get to the terahertz range in optics. So unless omega is so small that it becomes radio frequency uh, techniques rather than optics, then the uh, magnetic permeability is equal to 1. So far, we've only talked about static effects. So I have a static, uh, I apply a DC electric field, a static electric field, and the charges will move. But we assume that this dielectric has been exposed to the field for a very long time and the charges have had sufficient amount of time to find their equilibrium positions. <coughs> and the electrons are light and they can move quicker and the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the nuclei are heavier and therefore it takes them a longer time to move, but we don't worry about this. In, in, in electrostatics. If we have an AC electric field, especially on, uh, in the optical regime from terahertz to you know, even higher frequencies in the uh, ultraviolet, then the polarization may actually be delayed and this is just like with a driven oscillator that if you have a pendulum and you apply a force, then depending on the uh, relationship between the applied uh, frequency and the resonance frequency of the pendulum, you can see uh, uh, some quite interesting effects like resonance and, and phase shifts. So the polarization may be delayed. And the other complication is that the polarization may be non-local. So what that means is that if I apply uh, an electric field over here, then the, the charges here will move, but that may also influence the charges in another part of the crystal because somehow the whole crystal deforms not just where the field is applied, but also in other parts of the crystal. So therefore, instead of writing the polarization as a simple product of the susceptibility and the electric field, um, the polarization is written as a convolution, both in time and in space. And this convolution uh, means that um, the polarization at time t depends not only at the field at time t, but at the entire history of the electric fields that we have applied. So that's why this signal run, this integral runs from minus infinity to t. Uh, the polarization cannot depend on the field at future times. So we cannot predict the future. The, uh, there, and that is a big difference between this in, in this integral with the time integral and the uh, spatial integral. There is a well-defined arrow of time. You know, if, if you watch a movie, you know if it's running forwards or backwards, you can tell. So there is a well-defined arrow of time there is no arrow of space. So therefore, this integral runs in time from minus C, uh, infinity to t. And then if time is homogeneous, we can shift the time t by redefining a different type of variable. And we can also assume that we have an infinite homogeneous crystal. And uh, therefore, instead of depending explicitly on R prime and R, as well as on T prime and T, uh, the suscept this response function only depends on the difference between R prime and R and the uh, time that has elapsed since the field was applied. And now you know why um, I mentioned the convolution theorem for Fourier transforms. This function, this polarization is something that we can actually measure. 
But now we do this Fourier analysis that we usually do uh, to introduce plane waves. And then this convolution in Fourier space will become a simple multiplication. So the polarization as a function of time and position will become a polarization as a function of wave vector and frequency, angular frequency. And now instead of, in, instead of having a convolution, we have a simple product of the Fourier transform of the susceptibility and the Fourier transform of the field. That product gives us the uh, polarization and um, the similar product for the Fourier transform of the dielectric function uh, and the field gives us the dielectric displacement. Um, Non-local effects are usually very small. I will show you one example. It's an important example, but it's also a very obscure example that nobody talks about, except for this uh, Aglanovich Ginsberg book that I've mentioned earlier. Um, so non-local effects are rare. However, the uh, frequency effects are very common. And uh, if these frequency effects were not present, then studying optical constants would be very boring because we would only find a constant dielectric function. We would not try to measure its frequency dependence. So the dielectric function definitely depends on frequency and that is very important. Non-local effects are rare. So here's the one example that, one, that I want to give you for uh, non-locality. Um, so non-locality means that this epsilon depends on k. And in a, if we have uh, inversion symmetry or if we have a cubic system, then the first part uh, in the tail of expansion of this non-locality vanishes. So there is no non-local contribution which is proportional to k. Instead, we look at the uh, second term in the Taylor series. So we look at quadratic contributions. And um, based on symmetry considerations, which are explained, for example, in Nye's book, we see that this non-local contribution to the dielectric function is some fourth order tensor alpha times the uh, uh, spatial contributions uh, uh, times the uh, coordinates of the wave vector. And here the uh, Einstein summation over k and l is implied. So let's look at this uh, expression along the 0, 0, 1 direction. So along the zero, zero, if k is along zero, zero, one, then the k and l components of the wave vector, if I multiply them, that product will always be zero. Uh, because only the z-axis has a non-zero k, so that is always zero. On the other hand, if I look along the 1, 1, 0 direction, then kx multiplied by ky, that will be non-zero. So um, there were early experiments by Eli Burstein and then uh, Peter Yu, uh, who was a PhD student with Manuel Cardona, followed up on that in the 1970s. And uh, they looked at uh, gallium arsenide they looked at gallium arsenide and they measured the biofringence of gallium arsenide. If the refractive index along the 1, 1, 0 direction is different from the refractive index along the 1, 0, 0 direction, uh, then that is biofringence. In general, biofringence means that the refractive index depends on direction. So they measured the dependence of the refractive index on direction. And now these are uh, 
this is a very small number. Uh, these, uh, st so the scale runs here from 0 to 20 times 10 to the minus 6. Um, typically, if we measure uh, a refractive index with uh, ellipsometry, on a good day we get an accuracy of about 1% and on a bad day we get a 10% accuracy. So here we need a 10 to the minus 6 uh, accuracy and the only way to do this is with uh, what's called the minimum deviation prison, prison measurement. Uh, and very few people have this type of uh, setup anymore. Um, so if you measure the biofringence in gallium arsenide uh, at near the band gap, the band gap of uh, gallium arsenide is around 1.5 electron volts. So the band gap is here at the right edge of the graph. Then you see that there is this strong increase in the biofringence. And uh, the reason for that is because of the uh, non-local contribution to the dielectric constant. Uh, so that was 1971. Uh, the book by Agranovich and Ginsberg came out in 2000. Here is another example. That's a picture from NIST in Gaithersburg from 2003 where the biofringence is plotted versus wavelength for a number of different materials. So gallium arsenide, so this would be the old Cardona data, silicon, that is uh, Eli Bernstein's data, germanium, gallium phosphide, barium fluoride, and calcium difluoride. So you see that in all of these uh, cubic materials, you find non-local non contributions to the uh, dielectric constant, which causes a biofringence. Um, the reason why people were very interested in calcium fluoride in 2003 was because people wanted to do uh, lithography for microelectronic patterning using uh, 157 nanometer lithography. And um, this biofringence, even though it is very small, causes a problem when you try to print uh, small circuits using optical lithography. And um, as you know, 157 nanometer lithography, uh, many, many millions of dollars were invested into developing this technology, but in the end, uh, it, it was not practical, and the non-locality is one of the reasons why um, this could not happen. So this is an example which is not so well known, but it is definitely uh, important. Uh, it's definitely of practical importance. Yes. Um, this left side picture, you have two curves and showing a divided region for one, one, zero, and one, or minus one, minus one, zero. Why is this not the same? Uh, yes. Uh, and. Um, there was a problem with the initial experiment by uh, Burstein for silicon, and the same problem showed up in gallium arsenide, that if you have a crystal, then a typical crystal, even if it sits in your hand and you don't do anything to it, there will be some built-in stresses. So even in equilibrium, because of the growth or because of the way the crystal was cut, there is a small stress in the crystal. And the stress will induce a biofringence, which is of the same order of magnitude as the uh, biofringence due to the non-locality. So um, in this case, what you and Cardona did is that they measured the biofringence along a number of different directions, and they were able to deduce they were able to separate the non-local contributions from the strain contributions of the biofringence. So that's why there are, there are two curves here. So one is only for the strain, and that has been sub subtracted. Yeah? I mentioned before that the uh, 
the charges follow the field. The charges, that no, the charges do not know when you will flip a switch and apply the field. And therefore, uh, in this integral, the response function has to be zero if the field is applied after the time when you measure the polarization. So if you plot the response function in, uh, in a complex plane, then the uh, response function will be zero in one half space of the complex plane. And the charges cannot move before the field has been applied. So I will not go through the proof here, but um, in the theory of complex functions, there is this Cauchy theorem. And the Cauchy theorem says that the uh, principal part of an integral uh, is zero if there are no poles uh, included in that, uh, in that path, if there's no if there are no poles enclosed in this, I'm sorry, this is not the uh, principal part. This is a, an integral in the complex plane over a closed loop. So that integral over the closed loop will be zero if no poles are enclosed in this, uh, in this loop. And you can um, apply this integral to, uh, you can apply this Cauchy theorem to contour integrals in the real part, in the, in the complex plane. And if we apply this, then we find what is known as the kramers kronig relations. And these kramers kronig relations say that if we know the imaginary part of the dielectric function, then we can calculate the real part and vice versa. If we know the real part of the dielectric constant, we can calculate the imaginary part. So uh, there is nothing, uh, there is no physics behind these kramers kronig relations. This is just an application of the uh, theory of complex functions in the complex plane to the uh, response function and applying the uh, causality principle. So um, until the mid 70s or the mid 80s, uh, people couldn't really do ellipsometry very well because computers was not, were not around to process the massive amount of information that we're getting. And therefore uh, in the 60s, in 70s, uh, what people did was they measured the real part of the dielectric function and then they calculated the imaginary part uh, using the kramers kronig transform. The problem is you need to measure from zero to infinity and that's pretty hard experimentally. Uh, and therefore, uh, these days we are much better off with uh, spectroscopic ellipsometry where we can measure epsilon one and epsilon two and we no longer need these kramers kronig relations. However, when we do a measurement for a new material, then we usually check the, uh, we check the results against these kramers kronig relations to make sure that what we have found was not some divergence of the numerical techniques that give us bad results. So we always have to consider are our results uh, kramers kronig consistent. So um, let's now move to uh, Maxwell's equations for continuous media. Instead of saying uh, that the divergence of the electric field is zero, we now say that the divergence of the dielectric displacement is zero. The same for the divergence of the magnetic flux, magnetic flux density. In Faraday's law and Ampere's law, we have the curl of the electric field and the magnetic field. And here, um, for Ampere's law, the curl of the magnetic field is equal to the current. 
And this is another area where there are different conventions. And um, some people separate the metallic current from the polarization current. So if you have a metal, then the electrons will move in the metal and you have a current. We know what that means. If you have an insulator, then um, there is no current because there are no free electrons, but the bound electrons in that material can still move. So some people separate the current from the free charges and the current from the bound charges. But the problem with that, of course, is that when we measure the dielectric function with ellipsometry, we do not know whether the current is coming from free charges or from bound charges. We just measure a current. So my preferred approach here is to say that I don't care what current it is, I'll explain, I can explain everything with a displacement current or with a, with a current for free charges, it doesn't matter. These two terms are really one and the same. And therefore, I will introduce a, uh, I will introduce a conductivity and the conductivity can be from free charges or from bound charges, it doesn't matter. We just have a dielectric uh, we have a dielectric function, we have a susceptibility, we have a conductivity, they're all one and the same. We do not separate whether these are free charges or bound charges. Um, now in these equations you see that the dielectric displacement is a transverse wave but the dielectric displacement does not need to be parallel to the electric field. So the electric field is no longer transverse in anisotropic media. And a similar statement holds for uh, magnetic effects. So since we have these Maxwell's equations, the next step will be that we uh, take the, uh, take Gauss's law for example, I'm sorry, we take, um, yeah, we take Ampere's law or we take uh, Faraday's law and then we take the curl on both sides and we try to get a wave equation that we derive from uh, Maxwell's equations. So we take the curl on both sides and then uh, there is a uh, vector analysis expression to help us simplify what is the curl of a curl and that gives us this uh, Laplace symbol and this uh, gradient of a divergence. If the material is isotropic, then the, f the terms that I have here in red, those terms are zero. But the problem is that in an anisotropic medium, the divergence of the electric field is no longer zero and therefore I'm not able to simplify uh, these two equations and that means that in an anisotropic medium I no longer have a wave equation. I have two coupled equations for the electric field and the magnetic field. And therefore um, I told you in the second lecture I think that we typically describe the electric field with uh, two components uh, with a vector with two components. So here we need a vector with four components for the uh, electric and magnetic field or for the dielectric displacement. So that's why in, in many cases you see this approach that goes back to Berriman which has these four vectors where we treat both the electric field and the magnetic field. So in the Isotropic case, these red divergences, uh, they become zero and then we get the isotropic wave equation with a phase velocity which is equal to the speed of light divided by the square root of uh, epsilon and mu and this square root of epsilon and mu that we call the refractive index. And keep in mind that this mu here is typically one unless we're dealing with some very strange materials at optical frequencies this mu is one 
and therefore the refractive index is simply the square root of the dielectric function, complex square root. So if we assume that mu is equal to 1, if we assume that mu is equal to 1, then at least the magnetic flux density will be parallel to the magnetic field. And that allows us at least to set this term equal to 0. And uh, that is shown here. And then we can apply uh, one of the, uh, yeah, then we can apply uh, uh, Gauss's law for the magnetic field. So at least in one case, we're getting an equation which is no longer coupled, but uh, it, is, it is not a simple equation. And uh, uh, this equation here, you find that, and, and uh, uh, various ways to address this, you find that in uh, Agranovich and Ginsburg. But for the magnetic field, we still get an equation which is, uh, which is coupled. We don't get a wave equation. And the reason is that, well, we know, we know what is the curl of the electric field, but here we have the curl of the dielectric displacement. This epsilon, because it is a tensor, will not simply come before the curl. So this curl of the dielectric displacement cannot be simplified. In vacuum, we uh, expressed solutions to Maxwell's equations with uh, plane waves. But the problem is that plane waves do not solve Maxwell's equations if we have absorption. And the reason for that is that if we have an interface here and on the left we have air and on the right we have a semiconductor where the wave is absorbed, then a plane wave is a solution to the left of this interface in air, a plane wave is a solution. But once we get into the material, the um, amplitude of the plane wave decreases. And that's not what a plane wave does because a plane wave has a constant uh, amplitude independent of space. And therefore, we need to uh, use this uh, generalized uh, plane wave, which I first found in this book by Mansuripur. And so a generalized plane wave is a plane wave where this k is a complex number. So this vector k has a, a, a real part and an imaginary part. And it can be written as, as, uh, as a component it can be written in terms of these unit vectors u and v, which describe the uh, direction of the k in the, along the, uh, the they, these unit vectors u and v describe the direction of the wave vector, especially its real part and its imaginary part. So the crazy part here is that the real part of K does not need to be parallel to the imaginary part of K. So the wave can be absorbed in one direction and it can propagate in another direction. So the direction of absorption or the direction of attenuation may be different from the direction of propagation. And we see this if we explicitly write, if, if we uh, plug this, um, uh, separation into real and imaginary parts, if we plug that into the definition of the plane wave, then we get this part here, which describes attenuation, and the uh, other part here, the, the usual plane wave part, which describes propagation. And we see that we have to do this because in, uh, in, a, in an absorbing medium, the refractive index will be a complex number, will, be ha will have a, uh, a real and imaginary part. So therefore, the question that comes up here is, you know, what does it mean to have a complex angle in Snell's law? And the reason is, well, we don't really have to do this because we separate the wave vector into a real and an imaginary part. 
And of course, only the real part that describes propagation, that is what, det what goes into Snell's law, and the attenuation can go off in an entirely different direction. So once we have introduced these uh, generalized plane waves, it looks just like a regular plane wave, but now the K is complex. We can plug this generalized plane wave into Maxwell's equations, and we're getting the Fourier transformed Maxwell's equations. And that looks just like in the vacuum case, uh, what we're used to. There's nothing uh, too interesting here. Um, however, the problem starts again if we try to derive a wave equation from Maxwell's equation. So now we're getting this anisotropic wave equation. And again, the problem is that electromagnetic waves in, a, uh, in an anisotropic medium do not necessarily have to be transverse. The dielectric displacement is transverse. The magnetic flux density is transverse. But the electric field and the magnetic field are not transverse. And therefore, these terms in red, they do not disappear. But we have to keep track of them. Only in the anisotropic case are we getting a wave equation, which we call dispersion relationship between the wave vector and the frequency. And um, again, we're getting this uh, phase velocity where the refractive index is the square root of epsilon times mu. <coughs> At least in the optics case, if we set mu is equal to 1, then the second equation k dot h, that is 0. At least in the second equation, we get rid of that. But in the first equation, we, con we keep the anisotropy, uh, which means that the, uh, dielectric f f that the uh, electrical field does not need to be transverse. And again, this, ex this equation can be found in Agronovich and Ginsburg. So yeah. I Instead of writing um, Maxwell's equations with E and D, the electric field and the dielectric displacement, I can also use the constitutive relations. The dielectric displacement is epsilon, epsilon zero E, and express these Maxwell's equations only in terms of E and H and eliminate the D and the B. At least I want to eliminate the D. I, I can leave the B in there. At least for mu equal 1, it's not going to give me a problem. So if I do that, then um, Gauss's law, k dot D equals 0, now reads k dot E equals 0. Uh, I'm sorry, k dot epsilon E equals 0. And this equation has two solutions. And the first solution is that k is perpendicular to epsilon e. So if epsilon e is transverse, then Gauss's law is solved. That is what we call the transverse solution. d is transverse. Epsilon is not equal to 0, D is transverse, and then we get this uh, 
anisotropic wave equation that I showed you on the previous page. But there is another solution. Gauss's law is also satisfied if epsilon is equal to zero. So if, epsi if, if E is zero, that will be a, f a trivial solution so that there's no field. Well, obviously, if you don't do an experiment and not do nothing to the crystal, then that satisfies the laws of nature. But that's not a very interesting solution if we set all the fields to zero. But epsilon can be zero. And then an arbitrary electric field will satisfy uh, Gauss's law. Uh, so that is known as the longitudinal solution, that epsilon is equal to zero. Uh, but if epsilon is equal to zero, then um, H must also be zero, and therefore B must be zero. And um, since B is zero, K, perp K cross E must be zero, and that means that the uh, electric field must be parallel to the wave vector. So that is known as th uh, the longitudinal solution. Epsilon is zero, and this implies that the electric field is parallel to the wave vector. And uh, such solutions are uh, also called plasmons. Um, with optical techniques, there is a controversy uh, whether such longitudinal solutions can be probed uh, with optical techniques. And um, the position that is represented by Josef Humlicek is that uh, with optical techniques, uh, we cannot excite such uh, longitudinal solutions. And uh, therefore, you typically find such plasmons uh, only if you use, uh, if you have an electron beam. Only an, an electron beam is something longitudinal, and uh, therefore it can excite these longitudinal solutions. So one example of these longitudinal solutions is that if you have a, if you have an insulator on a metal, and the standard example is lithium fluoride on silver. That's an example from 1963 Berryman. And over here, I'm showing you lithium fluoride on silver from Humlicek, 1999. And if we look at the Berryman uh, results, this, we're plotting the reflectance as a function of wavelength. We see two frequencies where there is a dip in the reflectance. And lithium fluoride is a very simple cubic crystal, and um, it has one infrared active vibration, and the uh, atoms can either move parallel or perpendicular to the um, light beam. And we see these two dips in the reflectance, so that means there is absorption, and this occurs at the transverse absorption frequency, and this occurs at the longitudinal absorption frequency. So obviously there is a uh, there is a signature, there is something in the reflectance that we see uh, at the longitudinal frequency. Uh, but, like I mentioned, Humlicek's position is, and that's explained in this 1999 paper where he repeated this experiment with infrared ellipsometry. That's actually one of his first uh, infrared ellipsometry uh, experiments, uh, papers that he wrote. So the Berman mode this one, the Berman mode is an interference effect. It is not an actual longitudinal mode. Um, 
if you have a thin film on a material, then you can write down Fresnel's equations for this sample. And um, the reflectance that you measure is not the reflectance of the substrate, it's not the reflectance of the film, but it's the reflectance of the combined system. And this combined system, it will be some, if you measure, if you uh, calculate the reflectance of that combined system, there's something in the numerator and something in the denominator. And when the refractive index, when the, when the dielectric function of the film becomes zero, then something in the denominator blows up, which gives you a singularity. And that singularity that occurs, that is responsible for this drop in the infrared reflectance. So, if you have, if you have bulk, if you have bulk lithium fluoride, you will not see this longitudinal mode. In order to see this longitude, in order to see this longitudinal vibration, you must have a film on some sort of a different surface. If I will measure bulk uh, lithium fluoride, I will have long reflection band, and the high frequency edge will correspond to a, a mirror. Okay, so you're saying, well, yes, you can measure. Uh, you can measure the longitudinal and the transverse waves from reflection. Uh, yes, that is true. But if you do an absorption, if you do an absorption measurement, you will only see the transverse mode. You will not see the longitudinal mode. Yeah. And um, if you vary the angle of your incident beam in a reflectance measurement, then you need to model the data because the the, 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 the end of the Reststrahlen band will shift with, uh, with the angle. Yes, but if I take into account near normal reflectivity, directly. Approximately, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so this longitudinal mode is an interference effect which appears because of the applying the Fresnel's equations to the, uh, to the sample system. Um, the energy density, the energy density of the field is one half E dot D plus H dot B. And I can write that again uh, is uh, using the constitutive relations. And then if I take the second derivative of the energy density with respect to the field, I'm getting the uh, individual components of the dielectric tensor. And because the, uh, because the two partial derivatives commute, that implies that the uh, symmetric tensor must be, uh, that the dielectric uh, tensor must be symmetric. At least that is true for a, uh, if there's no applied static electric field, if you apply, if you apply a static electric field, then you're getting the uh, optical Hall effect and then um, there would be uh, anti-symmetric uh, parts in the dielectric tensor. So this symmetry that epsilon ij equals epsilon ji, uh, that is an example of an Onsaga relation. And um, that's a very obscure topic and people usually refer to landau lifshitz and somewhere in there you probably find it, but I haven't found a good uh, example for that yet. Uh, so that's the energy density which tells us that the dielectric tensor is symmetric. And then um, if we have the energy density, then we can ask, well, uh, what is the direction of the energy flow? And uh, that is given by the uh, pointing vector. 
And um, the interesting thing here is that we conclude from that that the longitudinal modes cannot carry any energy because in the, for the longitudinal mode, uh, this uh, field is equal to zero, so there's, there's no energy contained here. So we have uh, seen Maxwell's equations and we've introduced the dielectric uh, function. But now what I want to do is I want to show you how uh, the, how we can find some very simple models, phenomenological models, classical models, and th those are the, the Lorentz model and the Drude model. And with these two models, we can explain uh, most things that we find in a dielectric function. The Lorentz model will be applied to bound charges and the Drude model will be applied to free charges. So to introduce the Lorentz model, let's again look at our dielectric. We have applied an electric field and that will give us a polarization. Uh, but in this case, since we're talking about oscillations, the electric field, the uh, total electric field will not be static, but it will be a plane wave. So the uh, will be an AC electric field that we apply. And uh, if this was the position of the charge before the field was turned on, then now the field has been turned on and after some time the charge has moved. So this x is the, uh, this distance x is the displacement of the charge from its original position. And because we're applying the field in this direction, this charge here, it will move to the right with the velocity V. So what we do now is we draw a free body diagram. And we can do this with first semester physics. And we ask, we apply Newton's second law and we ask, well, what are the forces that are acting on this charge? The charge has been displaced and therefore there is a restoring force which wants to pull the charge back to its original position. So that is Hooke's law minus Kx, that's the restoring force. Since the charge is moving to the right, there is a frictional term which will slow down the electron and this frictional term is proportional to the velocity and it is also against the direction of motion. And the third force that we have is of course the Coulomb force, which the charge experiences under the influence of the electric field. So these, th these three forces act on the charge and the sum of these forces must be equal to the mass times the acceleration. And we can solve this differential equation with an exponential solution and then we find the displacement as a function of time and we have this, uh, this is the amplitude x0 times uh, a plane wave. The dipole moment associated here, while well, the dipole moment is equal to Q times X, so we can calculate the uh, polarization as the dipole moment per unit volume. That's the dipole moment divided by unit volume. And then the dielectric function is one plus the susceptibility. So with this model, we get this expression for the dielectric function of a charge. And there are three parameters in this equation. Omega plasma squared, that 
so there's this n, which is the charge density, times the square of the charge, divided by the mass of the charge, and divided by the permittivity of vacuum. This fraction together, we call that the omega plasma squared, and that we call the charge density. I'm sorry, that we call the uh, plasma frequency. And the plasma frequency is related to the charge density. It's related to the magnitude of the charge, well, that's the electronic charge, and most importantly, it is related to the mass. So if we say that the charge density is something like 10 to the 23 per cubic centimeter, which is a typical solid, then electrons will have a very large plasma frequency on the, uh, that is in the ultraviolet, maybe around 10 electron volts. But the atoms or the ions have a much larger mass and therefore the plasma frequency for ions is typically uh, uh, in the infrared region. The second parameter that we find is uh, the resonance frequency, and this is just from Hooke's law. The resonance frequency is the square root of k over m, and k, that is the bond strength, uh, and m is the mass of the charge, and again, this can vary uh, depending on whether we're talking about electronic, uh, char electrons as charges or as ions. And this model is, is very, very old, and 150 years ago uh, that was used to explain the dispersion of uh, the dependence of the refractive index on wavelength in a variety of insulators. So, what I want to do now is I want to discuss this equation and show you what that actually looks like. So remember, we have three uh, parameters, the charge density, the resonance frequency, and the damping constant, which has to do with the friction. And um, shown by the green dotted line, and I hope you can see this in the back, that is the absorption the imaginary part of epsilon and the red curve in the front. The red curve is the uh, real part of the dielectric constant. So you see that the uh, imaginary part has this uh, resonance type shape and the real part uh, makes this wiggle here at uh, some, and it goes to zero, uh, the real part of epsilon goes to zero right at the resonance frequency. And um, the amplitude of this resonator, the amplitude, uh, we sometimes write that as uh, a product of the resonance frequency squared, and then if we do it that way, then the difference between the high frequency limit and the low frequency limit of the dielectric function, that is equal to this um, amplitude A. You see that epsilon is neg negative. Uh, epsilon can be zero, then there is no absorption but only if you have an excited material and optical gain in a laser, that's the only time when this epsilon would become negative. This epsilon one here has a wiggle and the longitudinal solution, uh, so for these examples here, I've used a resonance frequency of three electron volts and a broadening of uh, half an electron volt and uh, a plasma frequency of uh, six electron volts. So if I'm using these numbers, then I'm getting a longitudinal solution. The longitudinal, solu uh, the longitudinal solution happens when the uh, epsilon goes through zero. So I can write that uh, as a square root and I'm getting at 6.7 electron volts. That's where the uh, real part of the dielectric function goes to zero. Uh, 
So the epsilon 2 is always positive, but the epsilon 1 actually can become negative, uh, and the epsilon 1 is negative from the resonance frequency up to this longitudinal frequency, which is calculated as a function of the uh, resonance frequency and the plasma frequency. Um, the dielectric function is, if, if we plot the dielectric function, then we see that the curves are rather symmetric. But what many people would rather know is, well, not what is the dielectric function, but what is the refractive index and what is the extinction coefficient. And these, uh, the complex refractive index looks much less symmetric. And the peak of the extinction coefficient is not exactly at the uh, resonance frequency, but it is somewhat higher. And the refractive index rises rather sharply below the resonance frequency, and then it drops very slowly. And, and here it almost looks like there's a hump here, right? So in this case, we only have one resonance frequency. There's no reason why this curve should be asymmetric because of the physics. So if you want to know the physics, it is much, it makes a lot more sense to plot the dielectric function because even in this simple model, there's some asymmetry built into the refractive index versus uh, frequency. So the refractive index may be more useful for optical applications, but if we want to understand the physics, then I prefer to plot the dielectric function. So the peak in K is shifted, the curve is asymmetric, uh, N and K are always positive. Um, N approaches one at very large energies. Uh, so this is N equal to one, so it approaches one, it's not quite there yet. But now the interesting part is that N is less than one above the resonance frequency and below the uh, longitudinal frequency. So whenever n is less than 1, we observe this Reststrahlen band, which is a band of very high reflectance. n less than 1 means that the speed of light, the speed of the wave, the phase velocity of the wave is larger than the speed of light. However, this is not a complication with uh, Einstein's theory of relativity because uh, this is only the wave velocity and the group velocity used to send signals uh, that would be much smaller. Um, sometimes people talk about normal dispersion and anomalous dispersion. The normal dispersion means that the refractive index increases as the energy increases. So the derivative of the refractive index with respect to energy is larger than zero. And if you see here, below the resonance frequency, the refractive index increases. So this is normal dispersion. And then from the resonance frequency, the refractive index decreases. That's known as anomalous dispersion. And then it increases again. Um, the fact that the refractive index is less than one is important in the X-ray regime. And if you want to do X-ray reflectance, then you have to take into account that the refractive index of the X-rays is just a little bit less than one. And um, by determining how much less than one it is, uh, you can find the electron density of the material that you are studying. So that's the refractive index, which looks quite different from the dielectric function. Uh, this is the absorption coefficient, which is four pi times the extinction coefficient divided by the wavelength. And that also is asymmetric, and we also see that the shift, that the peak in the absorption coefficient 
is actually not at the resonance frequency, but it is somewhat higher. So again, if you plot uh, the absorption coefficient by itself, you will not find the resonance frequency. You have to go back to the uh, dielectric function or do some modeling. And again, it rises rather fast and drops rather slowly. Um, and, and that's just how the math turns out. So the Lorentz model describes the motion, uh, the Lorentz model describes the response of bound charges to the electric field. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I got, I got ahead of myself. So this is the dielectric function. This is the complex refractive index, the absorption coefficient. But there are two more quantities that we can use to describe the optical properties. One is called the loss function, and the other one is called the optical conductivity. The dielectric function will have a peak at the resonance frequency. And the real part will go through zero at the longitudinal frequency. Instead of plotting epsilon, we can also plot the inverse of epsilon. If we plot the inverse of epsilon, which is called the loss function, that will have a peak at the longitudinal solution. The longitudinal solution was 6.7 electron volts. Remember that. So if we plot 1 over epsilon, then we're getting a peak at the longitudinal solution. And um, in that's something that we frequently do in the infrared range. Uh, if we do infrared ellipsometry, we get, uh, if we plot epsilon, then the peaks will tell us where the absorption bands are. And then we plot the inverse of epsilon, and that tells us where the uh, longitudinal vibrations are. Uh, so that is the loss function. The loss function is called loss function because uh, people find it often when they do transmission electron microscopy. There's something called EELS, uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy, where you shoot at your specimen with, a, uh, with an electron beam, and then you measure the energy of the electron beam before and after it goes through the sample. And um, uh, then you, you do that as a function of the incident uh, electron energy. And so you measure, the you measure the electron absorption rather than measuring the absorption of light. And um, so using EELS, using electron energy loss spectroscopy, you can also find information about the uh, band structure. But now instead of measuring epsilon, you measure the imaginary part of minus 1 over epsilon. So we can compare the. Uh, optical experiments with uh, electron, uh, electronic measurements of the loss if we take into account that we need to look at imaginary part at mi of minus 1 over epsilon. So here we're getting a peak at the longitudinal frequency. So that's the loss function. And the last uh, thing that we need to look at, the last uh, set of optical constants, which are all the same but different uh, variations of it. Uh, the last thing that we look at is the optical conductivity. And the optical conductivity is important especially for metals. And I will tell you that uh, uh, shortly. So I said before that. Um, when we look at, a, at the current in, when we look at the current in Maxwell's equations, then some people say, well, we need to separate the current of the free charges from the displacement current of the bound charges. In practice, we cannot do that because we just see a peak in the spectrum and we don't know where that peak's coming from. 
So therefore, we can either say, well, all the charges are bound, and that gives us a dielectric function, or we can say all the charges are free, and then everything's a current due to free charges. In this picture, if we plot the optical conductivity, then we assume that all the current is due to free charges, and then the current is equal to the conductivity multiplied by the electric field, so that's the conductivity. And this is the conductivity calculated from the uh, Lorentz model. And uh, this picture looks uh, somewhat similar, we uh, but now, in the dielectric function, we get a peak for the imaginary part. So the peak in the imaginary part of the dielectric function tells us about absorption processes. Here, absorption processes are shown as a peak in the real part of the uh, optical conductivity. So the real part of the optical conductivity tells us about the resonance frequency and then the real part uh, gives us a wiggle, but now it's flipped by uh, 180 degrees. And the optical conductivity is, is defined as epsilon minus 1 times minus i omega. So we would say that the vacuum has zero conductivity, right? That's intuitively how we would say, because in vacuum there is no current, there is no conductivity, therefore we need to subtract the contribution of the vacuum from the dielectric constant. And then we weigh it with the frequency. So a conductivity, uh, an, an absorption that happens at low frequency will have a small contribution to the conductivity, but a, an absorption at high frequencies will have a large contribution uh, to the conductivity. Okay, so far we've only talked about bound charges, so now we want to apply the same model to free charges. So the bound charges are bound, and that means that they experience a restoring force according to Hooke's law. The restoring force is equal to Kx, the spring constant times the displacement. That's why they're called bound. Now, if we allow the charges to be free, like in a metal or in an ionic solid, then the the restoring force disappears. There's no longer a Kx. There's only a frictional force and a, the, for, the Coulomb force. So because the spring constant K is equal to zero, the resonance frequency, which is the square root of K over M, the resonance frequency will also be zero. So for a free charge, this resonance term disappears. And apart from that, the equation is exactly the same. We've just set this omega zero to zero. So now the, uh, for free charges, there is no resonance frequency anymore. Instead, we just have a charge density and a resonance frequency. I'm sorry, and yeah, the resonance frequency is zero. We have a charge density, we have a, a charge density which is related to the plasma frequency, and we have a damping constant. And this model was used by uh, Paul Drude in 1900 to explain the optical properties of metals. And he already measured uh, the refractive index uh, as a function of wavelength at a small number of wavelengths using ellipsometry. Uh, what does the dielectric function looks like for, a, uh, for the free charges. Because the resonance frequency is zero, instead of having a peak at a resonance frequency, we uh, see a divergence at zero because that's where the resonance frequency is. So epsilon one goes to plus infinity and epsilon two goes to minus infinity. At large energies, epsilon 
1 goes to 1 at large energies and epsilon 2 goes to 0. So typically free charges will uh, not, free charges will not have a large contribution to the dielectric function if we go to very large frequencies. Uh, if you want to see metallic behavior, then we have to go to lower and lower frequencies, and that's where we are more likely to see the metallic response, the contribution of the free carriers to the dielectric function. Um, epsilon 1 diverges to uh, minus infinity, so um, epsilon 1 is negative from zero up to this longitudinal frequency. And um, for, uh, I've given you some typical numbers here, a plasma frequency of three electron volts and a broadening of one electron volt. What we measure experimentally is always a plasma frequency and a damping rate. And then um, if we actually want to know the plasma frequency, we have to know what the mass is. And I haven't talked about that yet, but the mass of the charge carriers inside a material may be different from the uh, mass in a vacuum. But if I just take the regular electron mass to calculate the carrier density from a plasma frequency of three electron volts, I'm getting a uh, carrier density of 6.5 times 10 to the 21. Uh, that's not particularly high, that's not particularly low. So materials like copper or aluminum will have a much larger uh, carrier density and uh, better conductivity. So that's why we might call this a bad metal because there's not enough carriers. So this is the dielectric function for free carriers. And again, we expect that the uh, N and K, the complex refractive index will look different because we've taken the complex square root. And k, uh, in this case, both n and k diverge and go to plus infinity. Uh, n drops off faster than k, n has a minimum, and then it increases again. And again, n goes to uh, 1 at large energies, approaching it from below, which is important for uh, x-ray reflectance. k, the extinction coefficient, goes to 0. Okay, the absorption coefficient for a metal has a peak at around half the plasma frequency and the absorption coefficient goes to zero as the energy approaches zero and it also goes to zero at above the plasma frequency. And that's why uh, we say that metals become nearly transparent above the plasma frequency. So this is the plasma frequency, and above that, the uh, absorption coefficient becomes small. Uh, this statement that metals become transparent in the UV, it's not exactly true because we will also have interband transitions. The metals absorb not only because of the free charges, but in metals we will also have absorption from bound charges, and that's why not all metals truly become transparent, but uh, uh, some metals absorb much less in the UV than in the visible. Um, so the dielectric function of a free carrier, we have the divergence, epsilon 2 goes to plus infinity, epsilon 1 goes to minus infinity. So because the resonance frequency is zero, we have this divergence at zero. But if we plot the loss function, then the loss function will have a peak where epsilon goes to zero. So the longitudinal solution uh, at three electron volts, that will become a peak in the uh, 
loss function. So if we want to know the plasma frequency for a material that we're measuring, then it is helpful to plot the loss function because then here the plasma frequency uh, will become a peak. That's the longitudinal solution. And finally, if we want to plot epsilon or NNK for a metal, in practice it is always very difficult to plot this because, you know, this goes to infinity. It is much easier to plot the conductivity where we multiply by the photon energy, where we multiply by the frequency, and if we're plotting the optical conductivity, then that removes the divergence at zero frequency, and we can actually plot the, uh, di the we can actually plot the conductivity all the way to zero frequency. At zero frequency, the imaginary part of the conductivity becomes zero, and it, then it has a peak, and the peak occurs at uh, roughly the broadening, I think. And then as we, if we plot the real part of the conductivity, then here at zero frequency, it approaches the uh, DC conductivity. In practice, it is very difficult to measure the conductivity all the way down to zero with optical techniques. So, and, so we have to extrapolate, and the extrapolation will not always give us a good approximation of the DC conductivity. The DC conductivity is equal to the product of the carrier density times the electronic charge times the mobility. So this introduces this new quantity here, which is the mobility. And um, tau, which is 1 over the broadening, that's called the scattering time. So this is the relationship between the optical regime and the electrical regime where you measure uh, resistivities. So if we look at this example here again with these numbers, we're getting a... Um, we're getting a DC conductivity of about 1,000, 1 over ohm centimeters. A good metal will have anything between 10,000 and 100,000, but um, a semiconductor will have uh, conductivities that are uh, much, much less than that. So um, in summary, uh, we've looked at Maxwell's equations for uh, continuous media, and we have found plane wave solutions, generalized plane wave solutions for um, these uh, solids. Uh, we've looked a little bit at uh, anisotropy concerns. We've looked at complications that arise from uh, spatial dispersion. And then we have applied the uh, concepts that we've developed for the dielectric function. We've, we've used these for two very simple models, uh, the Lorentz model and the Drude model, for the optical constants from uh, bound charges and free charges. So what I want to do in three weeks in lecture five is that um, I will give you actual examples uh, where I will show you um, optical constants for, for, for metals, for various uh, ionic solids and insulators, and uh, for semiconductors. And I will explain these results in terms of the Lorentz model and Drude model. Thank you very much. <coughs>
uh, nonlinear contributions to the susceptibility. Uh, the susceptibility that uh, I know about is primarily the first one, uh, the linear part. Uh, but of course, we have to take into account that there are second and third order susceptibilities which are proportional to the square and to the cube of the Let's electric see, field. Yes. So the, the question, the quest yes, so the question is um, about the ranks of the various tensors in this, in this expression. So if we start with the first rank, with the first order susceptibility, this is a three by three tensor. So it has two subscripts, I and J. Uh, the chi two has three uh, subscripts i, j, k, and therefore this is a third rank tensor. And the chi 3 has four subscripts i, j, k, l, so this is a uh, fourth rank tensor. So first rank tensor, second rank tensor, third rank tensor. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, second rank tensor, third rank tensor, fourth rank tensor. Uh, well, here I, I wrote it as a, as a tensor product, but uh, yes, I, I suppose I could write E, tensor E, tensor E. I, I, I could do that as well. But um, I have done very little calculations here, so I'd have to refer you to Nye's book to understand um, exactly how to do the calculations and to work with the uh, higher order tensors. Uh, so that's. I think so for my, uh, even Bomber, then he is not a fire vector, uh, 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 shows uh, a little bit confusing the Bomber in a level uh, I must know. I must know. Yeah, no, but you know, I don't know much about these, uh, about these tensors because I don't deal with nonlinear effects in, in the work that I do. Uh, is, yes, you have a question? Concerning the space vector k. Yes, the wave vector k. Yes. yes. The wave vector k. Uh, I think it was in the chat with Tina something like that when we said that it can be written um, more or less. We said that the propagation of F in H thing uh, can go around different directions. It's very difficult for me. We are just talking. Yes. So the, the, the comment is that actually, no, that's not the, that's not the right slide. Um, this is the right slide, yes. So the comment is that if this wave vector k is complex, then I have, then the direction of, a, then the direction of propagation is different from the direction of attenuation. That is very complicated to visualize. I can only agree with that. <laughs> um, but think about, people talk about uh, left-handed materials where 
epsilon is less than zero and mu is less than zero. So you would have to think of such complicated examples to come up with cases where attenuation and propagation have different directions. So uh, in my work, I have never really encountered good examples for this, and I haven't really seen any good papers which explain at, at a very simple level how attenuation goes this way and propagation goes that way. So I think we'll have to wait another 20 years for some good textbooks to come around which will explain these, these left-handed materials or other types of materials where this can be different. Um, exploring uh, these anisotropy effects are usually larger in the infrared spectral region than in uh, the visible. If you take a slightly distorted perovskite structure, then you don't see anything looks perfectly isotropic in the, uh, in the visible and in the UV, but then in the, you go to the infrared, then um, the anisotropy effects become much larger. And um, the field of exploring uh, the uh, anisotropies for low symmetry crystals, like triclinic crystals, monoclinic crystals, uh, you find uh, very, very recent papers in the last five years uh, which explore this. So, yes, I can only agree with you that this is confusing, but uh, I, I, I don't have, a, I cannot show you a, a simple picture. Yeah? Yes. Um, if you, uh, that may be true for a finite scatter, for a finite scattering rate. Yes. Okay. So the comment, so the, co the comment, so the, so the comment is that, um, uh, that the real part will remain finite for a finite, uh, scattering rate. Uh, but if you have a, uh, if the scattering rate is zero, then you, then this will actually diverge. Okay. Uh, I, I accept that comment. Um, the question is, uh, with the instrument that you have, how far can you go into the, uh, in infrared? Yes, yes. So in practice, in, in practice, what I, I will show you some results next time how the graph pl blows up uh, in, in the infrared and it looks like it, it diverges. Yeah, yeah. But if, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can see that if, the, if that omega is finite, then that may not happen. All right, uh, maybe uh, it's time to stop and um, I will be in Sweden next week and I will be at a conference in uh, Germany next uh, two weeks and then I will be back for the next lecture in three weeks from today. Thank you very much. Thank you.